cut out the sound effects. Okay, um, we are in First John chapter 4 this evening. You'll be opening your Bibles there. That is where we're going to pick up. And uh, before we look into First John chapter 4, we will have a word of prayer together. Wait. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all the love that you show us, that you show us love through your Son, Jesus Christ, that you are love. And that truth, Father, help us to internalize it and make it a part of our lives in such a way that we love one another. Help us to see other people as you see us. Even when it becomes difficult for us, Father, even when we think that sometimes people are not meeting our expectations or not worth loving, remember, help us to remember that we were not worth loving and you loved us in spite of that. That we did not meet any expectations you gave us and yet you loved us in spite of that to send your Son, to save us, to redeem us, to give us a hope of eternal life. Help us to have that same love within us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> you have to get on other people's cases for being late. Okay. All right. All right. All right, so we left off in 1 John chapter 4, and uh, the section we're looking at really starts in, uh, I guess, verse 7 is probably you know, a good picking up point. 1 John 4. And we'll, we read it last time, but we'll read it again. And uh, I'm actually going to read all the way down to 5 verse 4 because I'm back and forth on whether this chapter division is a good chapter division and today I'm feeling like it's not. So uh, 1 John 4 verse 7 to 5 verse 4. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in the world, in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because He first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from Him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Alright, so if you were to sum up the commandment that he's just super, super interested in here, what is it? Love everybody. Love one another. Right. And, you know, why should we love one another? Hmm? It makes God happy? Yes, Leah? Well, 
Well, that's usually when they die, Leah. Uh, That's not really on topic for tonight, but that's a good point to bring up. We talk about love for one another. Look at verse 7. Let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Love is from God. And, you know, he draws kind of this big, you know, equation here that love is about knowing God. If you love, you are born of God and know God. And, uh, right, we have now lost our most talkative student to the children's class. Uh, I have a quote by him later. Um, I hope I don't build up anticipation that way. Anyway, the one who love who doesn't love doesn't know God. The one who loves is born of God and knows God. And knowing God is this thing that John has been emphasizing throughout the letter. You remember in First John two, he was talking about the one who says, "I have come to know Him," versus the one who's actually practicing what he's doing. Uh, see how great. Uh, love the Father has bestowed on us that we should have chil- should be called children of God and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Verse 2, we know that when He appears we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. Knowing God uh, it, it is this thing that's emphasized not just in First John but throughout the whole Bible. God wants His people to know Him. Not just know about Him, not just know facts about Him but to actually know God, to have this relationship with Him that is based on love and trust. And if we don't love our brethren, then John says, we don't really know God. We might know some facts about God. We might be able to recite our memory verses and say, well, God is light. God is love. But you can do all those things. You can give book, chapter, and verse for a lot of things and still not know God. You might even be able to say, God is love in Greek. But you may not know God. We don't love our brethren. All these facts that we would know are useless to us. Um, you know, you could speak every language in the world. You could have every bit of knowledge. You could even speak the language of angels. You would be super generous with your stuff. But if you don't have love, in the end, what benefit is it to you? Well, it's not. Such as what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. I speak with the tongues of men and angels... But don't have love? It's just a bunch of noise. It's a noisy gong. It's a clanging cymbal. All these different uh, things come together. Uh, you know, if you don't have love, it profits you nothing. It is central. So much to the point that John actually goes so far to say in verse 8 that God is love. God is love. And that's such an important idea that he says it twice. He says it in verse 8, and he says it in verse 16. Earlier, in chapter 1, in verse 5, the message was that God is light. Here, God is love. And this kind of forces our hand a little bit. Because if we want to understand God, if we want to know God, then we must also understand and grapple with the nature of love. We have to understand what love is. And to the extent that we understand what love really is, in the sense, not, not what we want love to be, But love in the sense that the Bible talks about it, especially in these contexts, to the extent that we understand that love, then we understand God. But if we have a bad definition of love, if we have a perverse definition of love, if we have a false definition of love, one that perhaps was invented by the world, well then we're going to have a very corrupted understanding of God as well. And it's super important that we get love right. The idea that God is love is, even though John says it here, it's arguably the message of the whole Bible. It's the single background fact that anchors every other Christian doctrine. Not simply that Christ loves, but that He Himself is love. Not just that God loves, but that He Himself is love. Long before, you know, long after the New Testament was written, a bunch of guys sat down and had these big arguments about this, this thing called the Trinity. You know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Long before that argument ever took place, John made a bold declaration that God is love. He is by definition a relational being. Before the world even existed, there was a Father, there was a Son, they had glory together before the world was, as Jesus describes in His prayers in John 17 and verse 5. And from the beginning, God loved man. He created man in His own image, a kind of son, if you will, Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. He created man for the sole purpose of having this relationship with him as his children. He didn't have to do that. 
He didn't have some problem that he was trying to solve by creating man. On the contrary, creating man produces a bunch of problems. So why create it all? Because God is love. That's why. God is a God of love. He is a God whose goodness does not stop with himself, but extends to other people in a selfless, sacrificial way. He is a God of relationships. And much of what is said and done in the Bible is unpacking that very idea of what does it mean to have a relationship with God. Now, we talk about this idea. That the love of God is manifested by the fact that God sent His Son into the world so that we could live through Him in verse 9. Well, that's the same thing that, you know, the same truth that you hear proclaimed in that passage in John 3.16. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. But, what is love? What is love not? Let's put it that way. Or rather to the point, in this passage, what is love not? I should, we should be careful with that, because sometimes even the Bible will use the word love in various ways. You know, and sometimes it will even use the word love in ways that the world would call love as opposed to what we call love. But here, here, what is love and what is love not? Open the floor for you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Seeing someone in need, making sacrifice to help. We saw that in chapter 3, didn't we? You know, this whole notion of we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 17, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Luis. Yeah, that's good. You know, there's something to the idea, you know, that love is. You know, sometimes it's stated as this idea that you know we don't have love for God unless we have love for others. But then you get to chapter five, and it's almost the reverse is stated. You know that this is how we know we have love for the other brothers by keeping the commandments of God. Uh, so there's kind of a we're, we're in a vicious cycle here again, as John is so fond of doing. Uh, Mark, you have something. <laughs> No, no, I mean, you know, what is love? That's like the open-ended question of the century. <laughs> God created everything perfect. Where man got to Yeah. 
I mean, everything you're citing. Love is uh, all, all these things that God has done again and again and again. It's really kind of drives home the idea that God is love. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that love is not in this context anyway. Love is not that warm, fuzzy feeling that you get inside yourself when you see, you know, a girl you're attracted to the first time and your insides feel like a melted tub of I can't believe it's not butter. Um, no, that's not, that's not what love is. Love isn't, you know, so there was a book that's very popular, probably still popular, you know, the five love languages, words of affirmation, group hugs, positive emotions. I'm not saying that, you know, words of affirmation and group hugs aren't bad things. But is that what really is being talked about here? Well, it's not. Um, Love is not buying somebody expensive presents and hoping that they'll like you. A lot of parents do that, though, you know, and try to buy their their children's affections. But, you know, if God is love, he's probably best qualified to define it better than anybody else. And love is defined by what is the one big thing that God did? Well, he gave us his son. Sacrifice of Jesus. There's no... Better way to see you know, what God has done for us. No greater extent of selfless behavior than what God has done in Christ. And so when we ask, what is love? The first place I like to look is the cross of our Savior. God so loved the world. And God demonstrates His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5. Now, we start thinking about that. And then this question came up on Sunday, uh, which I did not have a prepared answer for at the time, and now I do. So, uh, Somebody asked the question, can you love someone without liking them? Hmm. And we were supposed to all go home and look up words and figure out what was meant by that. So the Bible says love one another a lot. John 13, it's not even just John that writes this stuff, by the way. Romans 12, let love be without hypocrisy. Galatians 5 talks about, you know, the whole law is fulfilled in this concept. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Ephesians 4 talks about, you know, love for one another. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 9, we are taught by God to love one another. 1 Peter 1 22, you shall fervently love one another from the heart. And over and over and over again, we've seen it in 1 John. Love one another, love one another, love one another. Is it possible to love somebody without liking them? You know, and I had kind of a, an out of the mouths of babes moment when I was, uh, you know, preparing for the. Uh, well, I mean, I wrote out all the stuff, and then a few minutes before church started, I asked John, "Hey, John, do you think it's possible to love someone without liking them?" And he said, "Sounds like trouble." <laughs> out, of the of babes. out of the mouths of babes. And there's a problem with that question. There is a problem. There is a couple problems. Well, there's several problems with that question, but the, the, I mean, first one we have is, of course, and we noted this Sunday, how ambiguously our terms are really being defined here. Because at face value, first of all, I mean, love one another is in the Bible quite a bit. The word like, how many times is the word like in the Bible in the sense that we're talking about? The answer is zero. I can't find it, anyway. And the reason why is because no, because the distinction between love and like is really an English thing, not a Greek thing or Hebrew thing. So it's in English that we're having this discussion and this controversy. So I went and got the dictionary, and I went and looked at a, you know, Google, because Google has a you know, pretty accepted dictionary, but you, know, you can find similar definitions elsewhere. All right, so like is defined as to find agreeable, to find enjoyable, to find satisfactory, synonyms to be fond of, to be attached to, to have a soft spot for, to have a liking for, to have regard for, to think well of, to admire, to respect, to esteem, to enjoy, to have a taste for, to have a preference for, to have a liking for, to be partial to, to find, to take pleasure in, to be keen on, to find agreeable, to have a penchant for, to have a passion for, to find enjoyable, to appreciate, to adore, to relish, to love. I'm not giving these in any particular order, by the way, but the word love is on the synonym list for like. And the antonym of like is, no, it's the opposite of like. Hate, right. So then I looked up love, and Google gave two definitions. Number one was to feel a deep romantic or sexual attachment to someone. Probably not what we're dealing with in the context of the Bible. Uh, At least not here. There are valuable passages that talk about that, but this isn't one of them. Um, And the second definition was, Anyone want to guess? Hmm? To like very much. To find pleasure in. (laughs) And synonyms, like very much, delight in, enjoy greatly, have a passion for, take great pleasure in, derive great pleasure from, relish, savor. This all sounds familiar, by the way. Oh, and one word is listed as the opposite of love. Hate. Again, 
All right, so there's a lot of overlap between like and love in English. Both like and love are used of romantic attractions. Both like and love are used of friendships. Even like and love are both used to talk about your mundane preferences. People can say, I like ice cream, or they can say, I love ice cream, and you'll interpret the statement generally the same way. But is there a difference between love and like in English? What is the difference? When we say love versus like, what do we mainly think the difference between those two things is? Hmm? Intensity, correct. It's a difference of degree is what we're looking at. Love means you like something more than just merely liking it. I like you is not as intense as I love you. I like ice cream is not as intense as, oh, I love ice cream. No. And I mean, granted, there's so many other factors in communication, tone of voice, context, um, sarcasm, things like that that can really you know, mess with the definitions of words. But generally speaking, the accepted definitions, like is basically, well, love is just basically like intensified. So based on these accepted definitions, can you love someone without liking them? No, that's kind of silly when you really think about it. It's like saying that something can be hot without being warm, or saying that something can be cold without being cool. Uh, it doesn't really add up. All right, Mark's, com- Mark, Mark's got a comment. Let's see what... Well, I was just thinking of passages that are preferring. Preferring, okay. Yeah. You know, right. Uh, and the other thing that I thought of Ouch. <laughs> okay. Do you think that's possible that you could spend eternity with somebody you don't like? All right. So, all right. So this, this is what, this is where, you know, I, I, no, I, I, don't, I, want, I don't want to be mean. I want to be fair. You know, when people, when people disagree with me, I don't want to be dismissive. You know, people tell me sometimes I'm dismissive of those I disagree with. So, yeah, I so, say, okay, well, let's sit down and try to see this and figure this out. You know, what about those situations where you love someone, but you just can't stand them? You know, and, and people ask that. Well, like, for instance, you might love your family but dread seeing them every year at Thanksgiving because of how annoying they are. Uh, and, okay, fine, yes, we know those situations, but, and here's my, here's my little sticking point, I think when we say that, we have redefined love. Very subtly. We have redefined what love is. If you redefine love to mean contractual non-hate, then... You know, well, yeah, you love your family, but you can't stand them. That is what it is there. Love says, I will go all the way. All the way. I can say, Yeah, I'm going to hold myself back. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, it, it's kind of like this whole. Um, I mean, does love act begrudgingly? Because, well, I have to. I'm contractually obligated to love people. So, I'm contractually obligated to love you, but go away, because I don't like you. Is that what, is that what, is that, that even makes sense in the Bible definition? Doesn't fit 1 Corinthians 13, doesn't fit 1 John 4, doesn't fit any passage I can find in the scripture, does it? What about God? God so loved the world because he had to? No. (laughs) God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but uh, at the same time, God doesn't really like those people in the world so much and doesn't really want to spend time with them. That's going to make eternal life awkward. The real problem, and here, here it is, the real problem with that question though, can you love someone without liking them? It's not actually about definitions at all. It's actually a very cleverly disguised where do I draw the line question. Like, oh, I don't know, Luke 10, 29. There's a lawyer who Jesus tells him, you know, the greatest commandments, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And the lawyer's first question is, well, who is my neighbor? Why did he ask that? Is it because he was intellectually curious about who his neighbor was? Jesus, this is such a hotly debated exegetical question. <laughs> like W.C. Fields, asking you, are reading the Bible? He said, I'm looking for a loophole. I'm looking, that's what he's doing. Yeah. I'm looking for a loophole. That lawyer was looking for a loophole. Exactly. Like every, well, you know, like every lawyer, you know, it's their job to look for loopholes, I guess. But, there's the problem. Yes, Jen? I have. Well, I mean, when it talks about the stranger or the alien, and you're, I think, referring to Leviticus 19.34, yeah. 
you know, I mean, by stranger, we're not always necessarily meaning people you've never, ever met. It can. But, you know, also people who, you know, they're not your countrymen. You're not related to them. This is the foreigner, the stranger. And especially in the context of Leviticus 19, in verse 18 says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then these lawyer guys come crawling out of the, of the woodwork saying, but who is my neighbor? You know, well, obviously my neighbor means not, uh, not strangers or people I dissociate with or faraway people or foreign people or anything like that. And so God comes again in verse 34 and kind of closes the loophole and says, "Uh uh-uh, no, I mean the alien and the stranger who also dwell among you, just in case you were trying to wriggle your way out of that. But since the lawyer asked, who is my neighbor, it's clear that even back then they didn't read Leviticus. So uh, that's what was really the issue. Uh, Okay, so... And here, here's, where the, here's where the issue is. If, you want, if you're sitting down trying to figure out the bare bones list of people you're supposed to love, you know, the people, oh, these are the people I have to love. I've get that list down, so I don't have to do it with anybody else. Okay, I've tucked that away, I've locked that, I've got my ticket to heaven punch, I've got the checkbox marked off, I love these people. What can I go do for me now? That's the wrong perspective to have. That's not how God operates. He goes far above and beyond for us, beyond what he ever had to do. And this is the difficult question. You know, does my love... When you ask, does my love for somebody extend to actually liking them, a less intense form of love, it's essentially conceding that what we're calling love isn't actually even like to begin with. That's a problem. Love one another does not mean plausible deniability. A lot of people seem to think that. You know, that, oh, well, as long as I have plausible deniability that my motives can't be interpreted as hate, I love my brethren, and I can get away with that. And any action is acceptable. Anything I want to do to people is acceptable, as long as I can plausibly deny, well, I don't hate them, so I must love them. But the... I mean, but it's Jesus who commands us, and he sees our hearts, and he knows what's going on. The Bible doesn't say plausibly, have plausible deniability and don't hate one another. It says love one another. And love one another does not mean plausible deniability. Now, I mean, you know, as one of you mentioned preferences, do birds of a feather flock together? Do people with like interests spend time together? Of course they do. That's not what's at issue here. But if love is truly selfless, and love is going to, start, going to push the boundaries a little bit about who do I care about? Who will I interact with? Who do I spend time with? Who am I going to try to get to know here? Who am I going to be willing to sacrifice for? Sacrifice time and energy and so on. You know, one of the best things about eternity is that no limit is placed on our capacity to love and our capacity to express love. No limits placed on it in eternity. We're not encumbered by things like time or distance or fatigue or any of the under hundreds of things that get in the way of every human relationship. You know, we're not encumbered by the fact that, you know, like say for instance you move halfway across the country or something like that. I don't know why that example is on my mind right now. But you're not encumbered by that stuff in eternity. You know, the relationship you have in this life, if you're really seeking the most you can out of them, they're always going to dissatisfy you because there's always more. You always feel like there's more. And our desire should be, well, let's push love to the furthest it could go, to the furthest extent we can now. But if we're not interested in that, what makes us think we'll like heaven? Where it's unrestrained. And so, you know, here's the thing. Showing preference to one another. Well, you know, I hang out with these people because they share my interests. Right? You know, sometimes, and this is, sometimes the reason you take an interest in something is because the person you love is interested in it. Sometimes that's the case. But then the Apostle Paul talks about it. 1 Corinthians 9. I became all things to all men. To the Jews, I became a Jew. To the Greeks, I became a Greek. Etc. And it's not that Paul was being inauthentic. It's not that he was pretending to be something he was not. It's that Paul had a bigger interest than being Jewish or being Greek or being weak or being strong. Paul's big interest was the gospel. Paul's big interest was saving souls. But does anybody seriously think that Paul stopped doing that to people the second they were baptized? No! That kind of 
behavior towards is you know something that you know Christians should have towards each other. It's part of the work of the gospel. I've heard brethren they put themselves out there, they get criticized as phony. Maybe the real phonies are those who say we love one another, but we're not doing anything to break out of our comfort zone and express our love in that way. There's something to think about. Maybe the real phony is me looking at my life and going, well, you know, why am I not putting myself out there? Why am I not doing what I can to push the boundaries? Because if we look to the cross, and the cross is where our definition comes into play here, we see a God who's willing to humiliate himself before his inferiors. We see a God who's willing to submit himself to the cruelty of his creation. We see a God who's willing to sacrifice himself to save us ungrateful worms who don't deserve it. Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? That's the love of God right there. Love, by definition, is selfishness. An idea that runs so counter to the warm, fuzzy feelings that people confuse for love. It's like even in the Bible. The Bible says that Jacob loved Rachel. But was that the selfless love that God defined? Or was that the love because she made him feel good and he was attracted to her? Well... You know, you read the story, you can kind of see how that that pans out, plays out. That is the love of God. And the love of God, you know, if if we're asking the question, you know, do I have to like my brethren in addition to loving them? It's not an in addition to, it's a prerequisite for. Because... You know, and that's what we do. We spend time getting to know each other. We put ourselves out there. We Sometimes we violate our comfort zone because it's the right thing to do. Because it's the right thing to do to imitate Christ. Hmm? It's a gift. Strings attached, right? Well, I'm doing this for you, but you better remember this. You better be willing to do that for me. You know, that's clearly, yeah, that's that's clearly a problem. You know, I mean, and you know, I mean, you could do things out of love for people, and they never find out. You know, they don't have to. You know, it's not our job to say, kind of subtly orchestrate a situation where, oh well, and find out and worship me as a you know the great superhero I am. Well, that's not what I mean. That's not. There's a certain self interest that's being promoted there. But love, by definition, guts the concept of self-interest. It is a gift freely given. It's a gift that is, you know, it's not held back. It's not, you know, well, my master forgave me 150,000 years worth of debt, but I'm going to go and get 100 days wages out of this other guy because he wronged me and he needs to pay up and he needs to stop mooching off of me and I need, you know, what happens? I mean, there's really a huge difference of degree there. And that's, I mean, that's the parable Jesus tells in Matthew 18. I'm translating the numbers for modern day uh, equivalents of you know, how much money that really is. He forgives the guy $10,000, a debt that would pay, take 150,000 years to pay off. And that's us. We've been forgiven that debt. So how willing are we, out of love for our brethren, to show just the teensiest bit to others? You know, because 100... I mean, and then, you know, well, you forgive the other guy's debt. Well, now you need to be thankful for the fact that I forgave you for that. As compared to what you were forgiven of? I mean, we should be thankful. We should be thankful people. We should not use... Love doesn't lord it over others. Love doesn't keep a list of all the stuff that other people owe us. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 talks about, you know, not keeping a record of wrong, not keeping a ledger of what's wrong. 
Here's the big list of things you've done wrong since I've known you. 20 years of grievances and everything like that. Well, if you have that list, now some people have that list in writing, but if you have that list even in your mind, that's not good. No keeping record of wrongs. You know, this is a, I mean, so, I mean, there's so many directions we can go with this. And when we ask the question, what is love? What does selfless, sacrificial, suffering, serving love look like? Then when we confront this idea, well, do I have to like them? You should want to like them. Shouldn't even, the word have to shouldn't even be in the conversation. And if it is, then there's already something that's messed up. It's already our hearts that need checking and examining. And I mean, I'm not saying this because I have mastered this concept, because I'm good at it, because, you know, there's a lot of people in my life, I look at them and I go, well, I really need to work on liking that person. There's a lot of headaches coming here, but there's no excuse. There's no excuse. I can't make an excuse for it. Because, well... God didn't make an excuse when it came to me. He could have. He had all the excuses in the world. You know, there's like, you know what I mean? Say all the excuses we use to get out of doing stuff, God could have used all those and more to get out of saving us. You think about what that means. You know, well, saving humanity. Well, I'm a bit busy to deal with that today. If you think he's the creator of the universe, of course he's a bit busy. Well, I'll get to that later. But that's not what happens. That's not what God is. Well, you know, they don't really deserve it anyway. I'm going to let this one slide. That's not what God did. And this is love. That he, God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Hmm. All right, so, any other thoughts? Yes? Hmm? Bears all. Bears. Ah, Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. See, yeah, you know, I mean, but even then, you look at that, it's not just, well, I'm going to go put up with these people. It's, you know, there's a hope involved in that as well. You know, we'll hope that things will be better, and then we can make this a better relationship. This can be a positive experience. That needs to be in there as well. Yeah. So there's a whole, I mean, you know, just toleration, putting up with it. You know, I guess that's a start. It's not the end. Huh. Mm. Oh. What was the question? Yes, Paul. Well, yeah, Paul and Paul and John Mark, right? But even then, you read that story, and you know Paul's not a perfect person either. Did you read that story? By the end of that story, well, you know Mark is clearly a traveling companion of Paul's. By the end of it, you know, read Second Timothy four, for instance. He brings up the idea that uh, Mark is useful to. What was it? Second Timothy chapter four. Do, 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 do. No, I'm thinking of a different passage. It's Colossians 4. My epistles run together after a while. All right. Yeah, Colossians 4, verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. And if he comes to you, welcome him. You know, so, I mean, there, Mark has clearly become the traveling companion of Paul in some capacity. Uh, which, you know, some people say Mark grew up some people say Paul grew up. Well, maybe they both did. Maybe they, maybe they started to understand something about what it meant to love one another. I mean, they, granted, there's a whole story there we're not being told because it's not explicitly told to us. It's just the implied story that we find reading between the lines. You know. 
There's something to that, though. You know, if somebody if somebody drives us nuts and we can't stand them, maybe that's the lesson we need to learn: is how to love that person. <laughs> Now, I'm, just, I'm saying that, you know, I'm saying that as someone who has had difficulty practicing it, you know. You know. <laughs> That's not a maybe. That's not a maybe, you're right. You know, try to hedge our bets, be plausible deniability. No, that's not how that works. God loved us, we ought to love one another. God's love is the greatest love there ever was. It was also the most completely undeserved. We have no right to lay a claim on it, demand it, take it for granted, and yet what? He gives it to us freely anyways. So when we love people who don't deserve it, and we do so freely, no matter how much we do it, we're doing it much lesser capacity than God is doing for us. And that removes us from any excuse. Is that hard? Is it hard to love people? No. People who grate on my nerves and annoy me? People who I'm suspicious of and don't trust? People who, I, you know, who don't love me back? Do I have to love all those misfits? Of course I do! You know why? Because I'm a misfit. Because God loved me anyway. If Jesus could love the world in spite of its hatred of Him, surely I can love others in spite of their hatred of me. If Jesus could love me in spite of me being a misfit, well, how much more should I love other people? Because do they really have anything on me compared to you know how God's seeing it? Eh, probably not. No. If we have this perspective on the love of God, then it raises the question, what kind of demeanor are we going to have towards our brethren? You know, I mean, we're going to gossip about them. We're going to say nasty things about them when they're not hanging around. We say, oh, we say nice things about them behind their backs. Brother, brother, if you don't love God, you love your brother. Love God, vice versa. Treat our brethren like God. Right. We should treat our brethren like God treats us. You know, you think about that. You know, I mean, we spend every waking moment dwelling on their faults and shortcomings, figuring out how we're going to have a big gotcha moment on them. We're so per- See, because we're so perfect, there'll never be a gotcha moment for us. Or what? We're going to make every effort to give them the same benefit of the doubt that we give ourselves. My, mo- you know, because we like to believe our motives are pure. We have a hard time believing that about other people. But loving your neighbor as yourself means. You know, you make the same assumptions about their motives that you make about yours. That's tough. That's a, and that's why, you know, when we say, is it hard to love other people? You know, people want to, you know, hand wave that. Well, yeah, yeah, that's the easy commandment. You love one another. And you know, that's the plausible deniability thing talking about. Love one another is not the easy commandment. It's the hard commandment. It is the hardest commandment in the Bible because you have to be like Jesus to do it. And doing it perfectly is not something that I know of anyone who has accomplished in this life aside from our Lord himself. And in the end, I look at my life, it's the thing I falter the most in, if I'm really being honest with myself. And because of that, can we say, I have come to know Him? Can we say, I keep His commandments? Well, or what we really need, the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all sin. And now we start to understand something about how, why John is on the one hand saying, you know, if no child, no one born of God sins, but on the other hand he says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. If we say we have perfected love, we are saying we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. We have work to do. And love is work. How did they... Also, well, I mean, how did the world world get to be Jesus' enemy? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, pray, prayer is a good place to start in situations like that. You know, pray for them. No. I mean, we're not supposed to be surprised if the world hates us. I mean, the world will hate us just as, it, just as it hated Jesus. That doesn't excuse the lack of love, again. I don't know. Um, well, we're... Like I said, difficult. Okay, we are out of time and didn't get very far. Um... So pick up with verse 12. Pick up with verse 12 on Sunday. 
Uh, thank you all for your discussion and for your comments, and uh, see you then.